We are back and we are joined now by Kanyela Ng, former state house representative in Hawaii and currently national director of the Green New Deal Network. Uh, Kanyela, thanks so much for, for joining us in this, you know, very hectic uh, and difficult time. Yeah, thanks for having me. So um, you are, as I mentioned, the national director of the Green New Deal Network, uh, obviously centered around combating climate change, and you are a, a native Hawaiian. Um, to, to the best of your abilities, if you could, can you just tell us what this past week or so has been like um, and, and the impact of the devastation? Sure. So there's over 100 people that have been confirmed that uh, the toll tends to keep rising. Only a uh, portion of the town of Lahaina has been searched. Only a few folks have been identified and um, over a thousand more are still missing. Um, so you know, that includes some friends and family uh, that I that I know, that I grew up with, um, you know, folks from your church, your sports teams, your, your classmates. Uh, and I think everyone across the island um, is feeling the same thing. It's it's somber times, uh, but there's also uh, you know some some silver lining. Like we're seeing community banding together in ways that um, we tend to do on an island, but even but ne never at this degree. Like everyone is really coming out for each other, sending money to directly to families, Venmo's, and donating, and just you know helping pretty much every, any way they can. It, it's quite remarkable to see. Yeah, I mean, and and um, I, right off the bat, what do you think are some gr uh, good organizations that people should check out if they want to help? Yeah, we've been telling folks, I mean, everyone on Hawaii is on Instagram. <laughs> it's like they're not really on Twitter or anything. Uh, so there's like Lahaina Venmo. If you just search that, you'll like be able to donate directly. But I think what has been striking and what I see in my work at Green and Dill Network is after these sorts of disasters, you see disaster capitalists come in or just capitalists come in and uh, hover above the wreckage like vultures and uh, really offer like predatory, uh, you know, offers to, to people who've lost their land. Uh, there are people right now, lucky developers, uh, land grabbers, just salivating at this opportunity, talking with elected officials. So we really need to be building power for the long run. Uh, so that's why we we established this uh, Maui Recovery Fund dot org, um, and it's going to be difficult to raise money for that when we really need it down the line. So like while there's still like cameras out there, uh, and people are are paying attention and not just only talking about Trump or whatever, um, we're asking folks to to help see that effort too because this is going to be years, um, even decades to rebuild. Okay, we'll put those links uh, in the description wherever you're listening to or watching this um, so people can, can help out if they'd like. But I, I want to return to that the point about the disaster capitalists because, I mean, that's how I chose to title this the, the show today because that was really the central thing I wanted to ask you about. The, the historic part of Lahaina, the, the capital of the kingdom of Hawaii, most affected, the history there burned to the ground. Can you expand on the significance of that area for Native Hawaiians? Because, as you mentioned, um, uh, there are going to be a lot of real estate interests that are already like foaming at the mouth trying to, to get their hands on that real estate. Yeah, I mean, Lahaina is special to anyone on Maui. It's where you catch your first wave, first fish. It's that's There's not much to do on this island other than that kind of thing. And this is where you do it. Uh, it's like where... It's like my first nightclub. I was probably too young, but that's, that's where it was. Um, but it's also, if you're native Hawaiian, like this is where, this is the capital of not just Hawaii as a state, but even before statehood, even before territory, it was like a central part of our, our kingdom. Like King Kamehameha the Great had a, had a palace there, uh, keeping an eye over the shoreline. Um, it's, yeah, it was the capital of the kingdom. Uh, and there's still today, there's, even though there's all those, it's laden with tacky, uh, tiki bars and, and racist, uh, trinket shops. Uh, there's some of the keepers of the deepest indigenous knowledge that still live there. When I was, uh, in office and I had this committee around ocean resources and Hawaiian affairs, I would, I would go directly to these people and ask them like, Hey, is this regulation coming down for the federal government? Is it true? And they'll be like, maybe it's endangered. 
nationally, but right here it's invasive and we actually have to pick it up and move it to the next area. We've been doing this for a hundred years and then I'll be able to relay it to Noah. Like that's, that's the kind of people that live there. Uh, so, you know, it, it is tragic to see, um, those folks, like those Kupuna, that knowledge, um, you know, wiped away. hundred percent. I mean, I, I can't imagine. And the, the history that was burned down there and, and the homes as well, like those are the ones is my understanding that belong to native Hawaiians and it's prime real estate, as I mentioned, but those were homes were already paid off. And, um, you know, it, it, it doesn't it didn't reflect the explosive cost of of living due to the tourism and the building up of second homes for the wealthy in Maui. And so um, if you could just talk more about how the the historic homes there, you know, what that what that looks like for Native Hawaiians who uh, probably are priced out of other places to live um, based on those same real estate interests that are trying to target uh lahaina right now yeah i mean lahaina it's like to characterize lahaina as like a place where all the native hawaiians live it, would it be right it's not why and i oahu it's like an area that's been facing gentrification rapid gentrification for decades now some may say generations um and these folks like the hawaiians that live there some of them have held on to that land in their families from before capitalists like capitalism really hit Hawaii definitely before colonialism hit Hawaii. Uh, so, you know, they're living like traditional lifestyles. Some of them are living subsistence lifestyles where they fish and hunt and, you know, just take what they need. And if they have more, they give it back or give it to their neighbors. Just like what, what is, what the modern world may call socialism. Like that's how they live. Um, and, uh, they don't have like the means. Like they, they, they're what some call, like would call land rich, money poor, uh, but they were mm -hmm. never planning on selling the land. So now it's like, where to now? Um, it's unclear. Versus the majority of folks in, I don't know if it's the majority, but a, a good chunk of folks in Lahaina who are snowbirds, second properties, they have good insurance, like they'll likely be okay. Uh, they'll, they'll likely raise more on their GoFundMes because they have these sympathetic white stories. But, um, uh that's uh, that's uh you know that's only going to exasperate uh, exacerbate the the trajectory we've been on like my family has was also forced to sell their homes before there was a fire right so this colonial capitalism in hawaii has always been a disaster so whether there's a fire or a hurricane that just accelerates the process can you expand a bit on that history of colonial capitalism in Hawaii and how, you know, this is just <clears throat> a continuation of that because in many ways, yes, it's climate change that contributed to the intensity of the fires, but it's also the changes in the veg vegetation and in the grass that is brought about by development and um, people doing whatever the hell they want <laughs> with their, their second vacation homes. Yeah, I've been tweeting about the history. Generally, when like I talk about political issues, especially to a national audience uh, here in Hawaii, like the way it's just a native way of doing it is you like show the history and how it shaped where we're at now. And Lahaina Maui wasn't always a dry, fire-prone region. Historically, it was lush. It was a wetland. Like you could take boats and circulate ar around Waiola Church, so the famous church that our kings and queens were buried uh, that burnt down. Um, and it was the birthing place of aquaculture. Like there are fish ponds all across. Uh, people would make homes around uh, what nature gave them. They didn't try to uh, plan against nature, which is ultimately going to be a losing battle. I think we, that's like, <laughs> that's the theme here. But the descendants of those sugar barons that, uh, or, well, I guess sugar barons at the, at the turn of the century diverted all that water to irrigate their, their stolen lands for monocrops, namely like sugar and, and pineapple. So it was no longer growing food that we could eat. It was growing for like unfettered global trade. Um, and then descendants of those barons continued to have oligarchical control of our island. Uh, they're the largest landowners, the largest uh, political donors. Alexander and Baldwin uh, is 
is like, yeah, pretty much the biggest land order in, on Maui. Those are two names from the big five, the original oligarchs uh, uh, of centuries ago. So as we rebuild, it's it's critical that like, when we're talking about the Green New Deal, it's not just about like climate mitigation. It's also this vision of like public land and, and water rights back into the hands of the people of a certain place. I mean, the government has to step in. This is clear. I mean, and then to prevent this, I would imagine what what is what it what would you say is Hawaiians' understanding of of what they they expect from the government in response here? And I'm, I'm, I imagine it's quite colored by past disappointments. Yeah, that's the headwinds we're up against. Uh, people don't trust government, and it's understandable. Uh, I think when you're a rural town like Lahaina or or anywhere across across the U.S., uh, they, like our our state only really relates to them when they're talking about tourism or the military. It's never about the people and their needs. So they've just gotten used to protecting their own. Uh, you know, we ensure our own survival. We ensure our own safety. Kind of that that anarchist mode of uh, thinking and. Uh, you know, in some ways, it's it's really powerful and needed. Communities should come together. On other ways, like we got to figure out ways to to build trust uh, with people and their government, and and show them that it's not the government in itself that's a problem. It's the corrupting influence of these large corporations that has uh, turned your government against you. And if we can build the power against those those corp, if we can fight against those corporate powers, then we can win back. Uh, support from our government and really right now like our department of homelands uh, hawaiian homelands which is provides uh, native hawaiians with homestead since the 1920s for the first time in our history it's fully funded after covid it has 600 million dollars and this is a chance for them to uh you know eminent domain buy back a bunch of this land and actually house the thousands of unsheltered hawaiians across maui uh, but there needs to be uh, some some reconciliation there for folks to understand uh, government as a force for good. So that's that, that's the headwinds. But we're organizing to to make it happen right now. It, it, it's it's for, from your sense. I mean, you served in state in the state government. Um, it, it, does this this needs to be a federal response? Is my my guess um, as to how you know. To, how important it is to to stand up to these powerful interests you need the federal government i would guess is like the best path forward that's right i mean you know when it comes to like climate mitigation the same thing like the scale of these problems require massive scales of investment and that massive scale of investment as well and when you're talking to like hundreds of billions or even trillions of dollars only the federal government can provide that the federal government is even uh, less trusted in some ways by uh, people who see um, the overthrow of Hawaii as illegal and that we're not a legitimate state. So, you know, it's it's it, it's like a matter of organizing and and political education where it's like this is our comeuppance. Like this is uh, like we deserve this as if anything as an act of like retribution uh, and uh yeah just even like getting people to accept fema's aid has been uh very very difficult right now uh so uh you can look at the politics here as uh, not really left and right and more of like decolonial which you know in a lot of ways is it is like all the things we believe in um but there needs to be a different way we, we approach it i mean what's the reaction um or, or and we need go clearly need government intervention in so many ways right um but but i feel like there is this impulse to rely on ngos <laughs> um and i just wonder what your perspective is on the ground of like the inadequacy of that kind of response well <laughs> i think there's distrust there too folks are like pretty uh defensive uh, and there's like big conflict between uh the Red Cross, Salvation Army, and all that. When, I, when I'm talking about community, helping community, it's not it's not really like the nonprofit sector. It's literally just people on the ground uh, creating these like distribution hubs, collecting donations in their Toyota Tacoma that everybody drives here, and just kind of 
going back and forth, selling people around and just showing up uh, any way they can. Uh, that said, like a lot of the things that were successful in like the national, the national uh, welfare rights organizations and the Black Panthers that made like the civil rights movement possible would be illegal now because of like IRS codes. You got to register as like a C three, C four, all the things. Um, so that's what that's what we're trying to make sure we're doing. So you know, a year from now, they're not like hitting us with like a bunch of citations. So that's been that's been a challenge, but. Uh, uh, we realize that like, this fight's going to be years, maybe decades, and it's going to get political. And th- I think that's really where people are, 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 are starting to understand. When you look at Puerto Rico or Harvey or Katrina or Sandy, I mean, there are still people that don't have houses. Like these temporary camps that people set up with cots and tents can last for years unless you, you know, organize um, not just at the community level for direct relief, but for a long term recovery and, and rebuilding. So, as we speak, like we're getting people together to actually start like a design um, process and planning process with the community. So we have like a master plan in hand and developers need to respond to um, as we're doing wellness checks, helping people through insurance claims uh, and FEMA applications. We're doing it community to community, not just from FEMA. We're like having FEMA train a community and deploy them that way. So that way we're building power. So a year from now, we might have 200 people helping to build a school and the next day they're like testifying at city council or wherever it's needed or doing a direct action. Like that's in, in my eyes, uh, the path forward. Well, um, thanks so much for your time today. Uh, Kenyela. again, it's, um, I just want to make sure we have it right. It's the, uh, Maui recovery.com. If I'm not mistaken, Maori recovery fund, uh, org. That's dot uh, org Maori recovery fund.org. Okay. We, we will be putting that in here. I'm seeing it right now. It's an act blue link. Um, if, if anybody in the audience has some money to spare, I mean, <laughs> people are hurting right now. Um, it, that that's the website. Really appreciate your time today. Kenyella. Thank you so much. Thank you. Emma.